have you ever wondered if God was to write an individual letter to you that Jesus Christ the head of the church was to write a letter to you or a letter to your church what would he say well as we continue to look at the seven churches of the book of Revelation that's exactly what happened at that time God gave John an incredible vision and part of that vision was to write to seven of the major churches in the province of Asia Minor in order to prepare them for what was coming into the world and what they were going to be going through as God's people at that time. And even though Christ does not write individual letters to churches today, the principles contained in these seven letters can actually help us to reflect upon ourselves and how we are doing in our walk with Christ. And that's why each letter ends with an appeal for he to, to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. And that's for us to date. And the seven churches of Revelation were a real physical congregation when the Apostle Paul John wrote down the vision given to him in AD 95. And his words became the last book of the Bible. So far we have looked at Ephesus, Smyrna and Pergamon. And in this session we look at the church at Thyatira. And we're going to ask not only how our church compares to it, but also how we as individual Christians compare to the Christians in Thyatira. And that's a question we ask as we look at each of these churches. This is the longest letter to the churches in the least important of the seven cities. Thyatira was a smaller and less significant place than the other locations. But no church is insignificant to Christ. And a church is made up of those who truly have faith in him who hold to the teachings of the scripture and it was about 35 miles east of Pergamum was where Thyatira was located and this is important because the Roman Republic was not a nation state in the modern sense a network of towns left to rule themselves locally under the supreme rule of the emperor and provinces are what made up the Roman empires you had the emperor then you had of course the senate and the political powers in rome but then power was also distributed to each province and then with each province power was distributed to cities and towns so the proconsul of a town or a city had a lot of power and that is why as we look at these seven churches even though geographically they are not that far apart the experience for each and every one of them depending upon who was ruling their city and the spiritual forces at work and at play there the experience for each church was very different Thyatira was a center for manufacturing and marketing it had many trade guilds and inscriptions found in ancient buildings there are for guilds of wool workers, linen workers, makers of garments, leather workers, tanners, potters, bakers, slave dealers, bronze smiths, and so on. And in Acts chapter 16, verses 11 to 15, we meet a woman named Lydia. She was a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. And she also had a house in Philippi. And now Thyatira was famous in its day for dye works, especially royal purple. And so she was doing rather well. We are told that she was a worshipper of God, a Gentile, that she believed in Jehovah, the God of the Jews, and ascribed to the teachings of the then scriptures. But she was not an official convert to Judaism. And after listening to the gospel as shared by Paul, her heart was open to respond to them. And we see that she gave her life to Christ and she opened her house to the apostles and his companions and she gave them hospitality. Thyatira's market extended across the Aegean Sea into Macedonia. Problematic for the economic well-being of Christians, 
was the divine guardian of the city, who was a god named Tyramenos. He was identified with the Greek sun god, Apollos. He was conceived of as the patron of the guilds and was therefore honoured in their obligatory festivities. It could be the reason Lydia had left and was trading in Philippi by this time, because what was required, it wasn't just going to a feast. If you belonged to a trade guild, you would go to those feasts in a place where the food, there was open religious ceremonies, where food was literally sacrificed and dedicated to idols as you were sitting there. There would be a big idol in the room of the god Tyrimenos. And after the festivities, all sorts of promiscuity and sexual orgies would take place. And you were expected to participate in a part of these as they were honouring to that God. And so, of course, this put Christians in a difficult situation. So let's read our text from, from Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 down to 29. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the address as to each church is speaking to the angel of the church, to the leaders, to the mindset of that particular church. The attribute of Christ, which is mentioned, is that these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Remember, they lived in a city to the... where. Tyrimenos, or the sun god Apollos, was central to the city. When you look at the sun, it has blazing fire. And here we see the description of Jesus, that he is the one whose eyes are like blazing fire. And both of these descriptions, the eyes and the feet with burnished bronze, are taken from the initial vision in chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, that we looked at in a previous session. And in Daniel's great vision of the last days, when the celestial being appeared to him, we are told that his eyes were like flaming torches and his legs were like the gleam of burnished bronze. The blazing eye suggests the power of Christ's ability to see through any falsehood and to be able to see into any dark place. He can see into the most distant and darkest of places and that includes the human heart that of his people he brings light where the pagan sun god apollo cannot jesus is making it clear that this letter is from him the son of god he is telling them that there is nothing that is hidden from his view he sees what takes place in his church he hears 
what is said. And we're not just talking about the gathering together of believers. We're talking about the lives of Christians. He hears what you say in secret to your spouse or your family about other people in the church, about leaders or other church ministers or other Christians in your church. He sees that and he hears it. He sees what we do for him or what we do not do for him. He hears the plotting and the planning. He hears it when we want to enforce our will upon his church, when we do not say, this is your will, Lord, when we see, say, I want to see this happen. And he's saying, well, why aren't you speaking to me about it? Why aren't you doing what I taught you and told you to do during my earthly ministry, as is written in the Gospels? Pray, your will be done, Lord, not my will be done. But this church, they are serving the Lord no matter what obstacles that they encounter, and they persevered. And the Greek word service used here actually means ministry, that every Christian is in ministry. The concept of full-time ministry, paid ministers, is misleading to the responsibilities each Christian has in a church, because every Christian is called to serve Christ in some form or capacity. You are called to ministry, not to full-time paid ministry necessarily, where you become a minister, but to an active role inside your local church. That is a call of God upon your life and upon the life of every single Christian. The church at Thyatira were doing their best to spread the gospel and to show love to all. And that is something that all Christians should be doing. We are all called together as a body, as a corporate group of believers in a local vicinity to do whatever we can to spread the gospel and to share and to preach and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And the description that his feet are like burnished bronze. Bronze or brass is a symbol that the Bible uses for judgment. The word burnished means just or accurate. So Christ's judgment on any situation is accurate, it's just, and it's right. And with such feet, he can and will one day stamp out all opposition to his rule in creation, the scripture teaches us. Now the approval that this church is given, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. So it mentions their deeds, their love, their faith, their service, their perseverance. Love and faith identify the motives for Christian service. That was the reason for their deeds and service. Not duty, not routine, not ritual, but they loved the Lord. They had faith in him. They loved each other. And therefore they served the Lord in the local church and the deeds they did were for him in his name and for his glory as a part of the body of Christ where each member fits in according to where God wishes to place it. Perseverance is the quality of those who persevere. To continue to try to do and achieve something despite difficulty or discouragement. A close synonym is persistence. You see, perseverance can also refer to the act of persevering, as in only through hard work and perseverance will we be be able to achieve our goals. It will not be easy. Do you persevere when the going gets tough? Or are you somebody who gives up so very easily? Well, let this letter encourage you to persevere when the going gets tough that it encourage all of us to persevere when obstacles come and the going gets tough. Because this is what the church were commended for. And one day when we stand before the Lord, it's what we will be commended for if we persevere in this life to continue to do those things that the Lord has called and asked us to do. That we do it out of love and we do it out of faith 
And when the going gets tough, which it does get tough and it will get tough, when that happens, we persevere. They were approved and they were commended by Christ and his letter to them for this. And so therefore we can equate that to our own situations, that for our love, for our faith, for our service, for our deeds, for our perseverance in doing them, even when it gets tough, the day will come when Christ would approve us for doing these things. So let that be a word of encouragement to you. You see, if we look throughout the world in every industry and in every culture, there's one consistent trend among successful individuals. And that trend is the ability to persevere. It's so key and crucial to our success in the Christian life. And by success, I'm not talking about in the eyes of people. I'm talking about in front of God that our ministry, that our service has been worthwhile and approved by him because he considers it successful, that we've persevered despite the obstacles, discouragements and things that may come our way. Perseverance is the ability to stand up and take a step forward when everybody else sits down or steps back. The trait of perseverance is something we must cultivate and develop in our spiritual lives if we are going to fulfil the call that God has upon us as the apostle paul wrote to the church in philippi but one thing i do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead i press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of god in christ jesus you can't win the race as though you've already crossed the finish line when there's still several laps to go can you every athlete knows that. And isn't it interesting that the Apostle Paul wrote that to the church of Philippi about perseverance and Lydia had come from the Thyatira to Philippi where they had been commended for their perseverance and so that would have been her reminder to her as she either read or heard read to her the letter of the Apostle Paul to persevere. Whilst the love of the Ephesian church had decreased, the practical expression of love at Thyatira had grown. That they, they were told, you are doing more now than you first did. But there was an accusation against this church that the Lord brought. That the Thyatiran Jezebel was probably a prominent woman in the church who, like her Old Testament namesake, was influencing the people of God to forsake loyalty to him. Some scholars, a few have suggested this could have been Lydia and why she left, but I don't think that holds up any academic weight or merit whatsoever. This was a prominent woman in the church who was promoting tolerance of and encouraging involvement in the pagan feasts that we mentioned earlier. That these feasts, they often ended in sexual orgies and promiscuity in honour of the god Apollos, whose statue would be in the room where all the people were eating and feasting. And she was encouraging the people, well, it's not so bad to actually be involved in this because we can be part of the guilds then, we can continue to trade. It wasn't a formal teaching she was given, but unexamined assumptions and it had caused a considerable number of Christian believers in the church at Thyatira to make some fatal compromises with the secular or the pagan environment around them. And she claimed that she had the gift of prophecy. She was encouraging religious indefinity, unfaithfulness to God, which is a common theme in the Old Testament. And Jezebel was not willing to repent of her alliance with the pagan environment, just like her Old Testament namesake. She had one foot inside the church and one foot outside of it. And Christ had given her time to change, to repent, to turn her life around, but she was willing, unwilling. And here we see that her chance had gone. Think about that. There came a day when here... As the Lord said, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. 
so I will cast her on a bed of suffering. Think about that. Her time to repent had come and the Lord was now going to be treating her in a different way. That should really cause us some serious reflection upon our lives as his people. And it talks about her children. And it's talking about her spiritual children, not her literal children of her promiscuity. It was those who followed her antinomian doctrines. And by the word antinomian, that means a person who believes that Christians are released by grace from the obligation of living any sort of moral life. It was a teaching that actually has endured throughout the Christian ages. And you see, we know this is her spiritual children because when the Roman proconsul was greeting a resident in Pergamon, a man named Papulos, who was a Christian, stood before him. And the proconsul asked him, do you have many children? He asked Papulos. And Papulos said, I have children in the Lord in every province and city. He replied, so the word children is replying to Jezebel's converts to her way of thinking that she was encouraging these people it's okay to join in with these feasts it's okay to join in with the sexual orgies because only when you truly know and experience and understand sin can you recognize what grace is we see this teaching at various times throughout the christian church in history rasputin a famous russian priest of history was a member of a sect called the Kalisti and they believed that actually in order to understand grace you had to commit the most vilest of sins as many as you possibly could because then when you had experienced sin you could see that actually Satan has no power to hold you in it and Christ will bring you by his grace out of it. This isn't talking about people who don't know Christ the antinomian doctrines it's talking about those who do know him that just go and live as you like go and indulge in sin go and do whatever you want because that will help you understand the grace of God this is what this woman was teaching and the rest of the church were either ignoring it tolerating it or participating in it and that was the accusation the Lord brought against them. And you see the different circumstances. Pergamon had pressure without, but Thyatira had poison within that was corrupting the life of that local church. And so the letter is quite powerful language. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds that she would be put on a bed of suffering. Now, it could be, it's certainly talking about that illness would be the result of their sin. And it could be a reference to the widespread sexual infections of that day, still around in our day, but now we have cures for some of them, but which would lead to certain death because there was no cure. Sexual infections that would cause people to suffer intensely, and if untreated, some of these infections would remain in your body. They would begin to damage the internal organs, including the brain, nerves, eyes, hearts, blood vessels, livers, bones and joints. You would die an agonising death. It's a legitimate interpretation to look at this text and to realise that the Lord is saying to them, well, if you continue to do this, then you're going to catch these infections sooner or later. And it will bring you on an intense bed of suffering and illness and eventually death. And it's quite a, a stark warning. The death can be agonizing. And then we are told the reason is that then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay you each according to your deeds. That's something we see throughout the scripture. As Jeremiah wrote about the Lord, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct. Jesus himself said, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. And the Apostle Paul wrote, God will repay each person according to what they have done. 
And so the Lord in this letter says to the church at Thyatira, Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to a teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. And so their deeds and their service, prompted by their faith and their love, which they were persevering in, he was saying, continue to do that until I return. These deep secrets of Satan, which were mentioned there, as I said, were a reference to the view that in order to appreciate fully the grace of God, you must first plumb the depths of evil and experience all of the vice that this world has to offer. And the Lord was saying, that's not the way to be a Christian. This is what I have against you for doing that. But what I approve you of is your love and your faith, which prompts your service and your deeds, which you're persevering in and increasing. You're doing more now than you did at first. And keep doing these things until I return. And isn't that a wonderful message and encouragement for us as Christians today? to keep persevering in our deeds and in our service, prompted by our faith and our love, and to hold on to what we have, to not go back or compromise now. Because he says, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Authority over the nations was a regular feature of Jewish eschatology that the followers of the Messiah would share in his final view rule. A shepherd's staff was an oak club capped in Iam, to ward off attacks from marauding beasts, but also the crook to be able to help those who are in trouble, that in eternity, that we will help to rule the vastness of creation with Christ. Think about that. We don't even know in this creation how many billions of planets or galaxies there are. And in eternity, we are told that the reward we get will be to rule over a creation, an eternal creation, to share in the rule with Christ. A crea creation that no mind has yet conceived, no ear has heard, no eye has seen, no tongue has adequately explained how incredible and how great it will be but to the Christian who overcomes in this life and perseveres that is what Christ himself it says to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end I will give authority over the nations that's not just the nations of this earth that's talking about throughout eternity the shattering of the pottery pottery refers to the absolute rule of Christ that is coming to this world and to creation and he says just as i have received authority from my father i will also give that one the morning star now this needs a bit of explanation and we'll close with this the morning star is the planet venus it's a title given to jesus in the scriptures which means light bearer but also satan is given that title in isaiah so why are both Jesus and Satan referred to as the morning star? And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, it says unmistakably that Jesus is identified as the morning star. And then when you look at Isaiah chapter 14, where there's a reference to the morning star, which is Satan, Lucifer. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. And Jesus himself said, as recorded in the Gospel of Luke, that he saw Satan fall from heaven like a blazing star. So why 
a Jesus and Satan given the same title. There's other parts of the scripture. Revelation chapter 5, 5, where Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yet in 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan is compared to a lion seeking someone to devour. The point is this, in the reference to the morning star and in the reference to the lion, Jesus and Satan, to a certain extent, have similarities to both. Jesus is similar to a lion in that he is the king, he is royal and majestic. But the similarity of Satan to a lion is different. That he seeks to devour other creatures. He is not there as the symbolic lion that Jesus was to protect and to guard a, seri uh, a, a symbol of majesty. He is there as a prey and a predator that seeks to devour and destroy Christians in this context. The idea of a bright morning star is a star that outshines all the others and Jesus is the one who is called the bright morning star. He is the morning star, is the symbol the scripture gives to him. Where Satan is like a morning star, he's a poor imitator of it. Jesus as God incarnate, the Lord of the universe, is the bright and morning star. He is the most holy and powerful light in all the universe because his very nature is light. When Christ goes somewhere, when he went, walked to this world and he went somewhere, in the flesh he said that he was the light of the world. When he walks amongst his churches, now he is the light of the world. He brings light because he is light. Satan is an imitator of that light. That's why we are warned in the scripture that he can appear deceptively as an angel of light. But Satan is only a created being. His light only exists to the extent that God created it. But Jesus is the light of the world and only Jesus is the true morning star. But I wanted to give that brief explanation just that when you see these things in the scripture, that it doesn't cause confusion in your mind to think, well, there's inconsistency here. Why is Satan called the morning star and also Jesus? Because Satan is the imitator, but Jesus is the true light of the world. So we'll close by saying what God said in his vision and gave to John to every church, all seven churches. He who has ears to hear let them hear what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. Amen.